Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. ARK Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARK. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARK or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARK to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARK Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the FYI, the four-year innovation podcast with ARK Invest. It's me, Tasha Keeney, ARK analyst, and I'm here with my partner analyst, Sam Chorus. Sam, you and Kathy are about to interview Mitch Daniels. That's right. And we're really excited to have him on. He's the former governor of Indiana and current president of Purdue University. And we're going to be talking online education. Yeah. And why do you care about online education? I I thought you covered robots. That's a great point. And a question we're often asked. One of the big things we see with automation generally is people say, oh, no, robots, they're going to steal our jobs. But really, we think they're going to create a lot of new jobs, more jobs than they replace. But in order for people to take those jobs, there's going to need to be a lot of retraining. And so education is going to play a key role in this. And what we're seeing is that online education allows for people who are actively working or don't want to relocate to upskill or reskill for new jobs. Got it. And so Purdue has has done a lot of work in sort of building out this platform. They have. They're definitely one of the leaders. And we invest in a company called TuU. That's a platform for schools to do this. Uh, But Purdue has actually done a few things on their own. One of them was an acquisition. And then they've also done stuff in-house. So it's very interesting. I'm really looking forward to talking to Mitch about what's going on at Purdue. All right. Well, let's get to it. Let's hear you, Kathy, and Mitch. So, Governor Daniels, we're so honored that uh, you agreed to do this podcast. We have a link to Indiana, to Purdue in particular. Matt Stout it works on our marketing team, our social marketing team. And he spent 10 years in Purdue's athletic department doing your communication strategy. And so we're very blessed. I know that Tom Schott works in your office. That's how we made the link to you. So we're very grateful for your willingness to do this with us. We think education is one of the most important topics as we do our research. And we know that you've been the president of Purdue since 2013, I believe, and that you have really shaken the place up. And we'd love to know a little bit about that, how you did it, the reaction to it, and why you did it. And we'd also like to get a sense of where you think education generally in the United States is today. Before we started this podcast, we talked a little bit about risk-taking. And I know you're, I don't know if you'll put it out, but you've got an editorial in the works for the Washington Post. And I think it's an important subject, this idea of risk-taking. Have we lost it? And the way we have framed this issue for us in the investment world is we saw risk-taking diminish after the tech and telecom bust, and even more so after 08, 09, the meltdown. And we saw very backwards looking ideas moving into the investment realm, like, oh, let's just copy this index. Active managers don't know what they're doing anymore. And these indexes do better than they do. Well, that was a self-fulfilling prophecy for a while, but we think something's changing now. And we think that because of the coronavirus, the desire to make changes has increased. Why? Because consumers and businesses are afraid. They were afraid during the coronavirus that they would lose their jobs, lose their businesses. And so they were willing to change the way they were doing things. So we're seeing an acceleration 
of the adoption of innovation. The five platforms we're focused on, DNA sequencing, robotics, energy storage, artificial intelligence, and blockchain technology, all of them have been turbocharged. And in fact, years have been of companies did not expect to see some customers they're seeing now for years. So something has changed. And we'd love to talk about risk taking generally in this economy, but also within the educational system and talk about some of the ways that you are shaking up education. What has worked in the last seven, eight years, lessons learned in the last seven, eight years. I know those are a lot of topics, so I'll let you start where you would like. Where I'd like is first to thank you for the opportunity and honors all mine. I've studied up on uh, what ARC is and uh, everything you just said about the uh, economic importance, societal importance of successful risk-taking uh, is maybe one of the most central questions we're facing, and particularly in the aftermath of the experience we're, we're all still going through. Here's an irony, I think, that bears on this when you ask about education, particularly higher education. Most people in it fancy themselves very forward-thinking, very uh, obviously intelligent, thought leaders and so forth. As a sector, however, it's the most reactionary place I've ever been. You know, any sort of change is immediately uh, suspect and usually pounced upon. Now, you and I would understand from business experience why this might be. Any business that is extraordinarily successful for a long time assumes it has all the answers and that those answers will always prevail. And higher ed has been uniquely insulated. I wrote another column one time about the parallel between higher education and healthcare, which have been the two certainly largest sectors of the economy where technology has penetrated the least, productivity has advanced the least, and therefore costs are the most out of line with what people, most people find reasonable. So uh, first of all, it's never been our intention, it's not today here at Purdue University to shake up anybody or certainly not the rest of higher ed. We're just trying to do what we think makes sense for this institution. I'm a little bemused sometimes when people find it far-reaching because I think all things being relative, maybe it is, you know, some of what we've done. We've held, for instance, one of the better known differences here. We have, you know, held the tuition flat for, it will be at least 10 years in another couple and uh, re reduced a couple other fees. So it's less expensive to attend our school now in nominal dollars than it was in 2012. And uh, that has, I think, proven not only a, an appropriate thing to do if you're interested in accessibility, affordability, students and their families being able to reach, uh, progress through higher ed, but uh, it hasn't been as bad as a uh, business strategy either because we had 58,000 applications this year. We've broken a record every single year. And when you're picking investments, I'm, you probably look for companies with a growing top line. We've had one, but I don't think that, or that was such an obvious thing to me uh, coming here as an outsider to the sector eight and a half years ago, I think all the problems higher ed is now experiencing were completely foreseeable. I guess my only surprise is it took so long for them to get here. I'm talking about things like consumer resistance to the uh, prices that are being charged relative to any proven value that the sector has been able to demonstrate. So yes, I wrote in my most recent annual letter to the campus, I was talking about all these nice things people have said, some awards we've won, innovative this, you know, innovative that. I said, you know, when the traffic is moving two miles an hour and you're driving 10, people think you're a Ferrari. But, you know, I just, I really think we've had a whole lot more to do to, uh, first of all, uh, to continue to add demonstrated value high quality at a price people can afford to this product. And meanwhile, particularly propelled by the year of Zoom that uh, we've just uh, experienced and all the other impacts of the pandemic, we have to scramble now to more quickly than we already were, make uh, the experience, the acquisition of useful information and ways of uh, learning new information more flexible, even more relevant. Probably, uh, for instance, 
we can't stay tied to this four-year agrarian calendar. We will soon be a year-round university at Purdue. We're about to open a January semester, and at that point, there will not be a month of the year when our capacity sits idle and where a student can't progress if they want. We have three-year degrees, a majority available for a majority of our disciplines. I don't doubt that before long we'll have students coming and going to employers with whom they've struck up a relationship with our help you know, early in their time here, maybe on the way in the door. So uh, these are the kind of new experiments and new uh, offerings that we think will be necessary for survival. Meanwhile, you're seeing colleges close, you're seeing uh, them shrink. And those who have thought what has worked for eight centuries would continue to are, I think, about to be a surprise. Before I turn this over to Sam Corris, who has done a lot of our work on automation, when we started the firm, the headline out there in 2014 was from Oxford University, 47% of all the people in the United States are going to lose their jobs to automation and artificial intelligence, hair on fire, right? And that's where they left it. And we turned that on its head and we said, wait a minute, there's another side to this. Yes, that's displacement, but what? how much productivity will there be? And what we learned as we followed through on their analysis was, it is true, there's going to be a lot of change and you need to get on the right side of change, education being critically important. What this will do in terms of productivity It will mean that in the year 2035, the U.S. GDP will not be 28 trillion. It will be 40 trillion. And those 12 trillion dollars will belong to new jobs that we probably can't even imagine yet. So how does that fit into the way you're thinking about the world? And I just wanted to ask, I heard last week Elon Musk saying that his children are being educated by YouTube. Now, he's very scientifically oriented. I'm sure he's pointing them in certain directions, but YouTube and Twitter and their developing followers and following people who are really making things happen in their respective spaces. Are you integrating anything like the -the off-the-shelf ways of attaining information from very well-known people that are freely available today? We don't have to devise those because uh, our students come in the door very, very expert at how to access all those things. And they do, uh, you know, maybe more than they should or maybe to the detriment of other uh, sources that might be uh, just as helpful, occasionally more accurate. We still believe that the residential experience integrated with these new modes of learning. I mean, it's not new. A majority of our students for the last several years, let me say this another way. Almost all of our graduates for the last several years have had at least one online course while they were here. Most of the summer study that is done here is online, certainly all the growth in it is. And so it's a matter of degree how much we use and what those modes are. You mentioned uh, AI, for instance. We are very determined to have it play a much bigger role in the educational process here than it already does. For Here's an example. Students today write very, very poorly. And if anybody thinks that's, you know, so what, that's outmoded, every time uh, businesses are surveyed about what they wish their graduates, what they're looking for in their new employees, a facility with written expression is at or or near the top of the list. Some of the brightest kids, I've taught a class here, some of the brightest kids we have can't write where the lick. Well, we would assign a lot more writing at a school our size, except there aren't enough professors and teaching assistants to grade all those papers or to, uh, you know, assess them. But an AI could. And so we want to build the best one we possibly can and then assign a lot more writing than we've been able to. Everybody is chasing, and I hope we come in uh, near the front, using AI for the assessment during term of a student. The uh, machine can identify whether uh, that Sam already has mastered this and Mitch hasn't, and then send Mitch some remedial or take Mitch back over some of the uh, material that apparently he didn't grasp the first time. Now, many, many businesses in the competitive world are way down the trail using these tools in ways like this. I'm bringing them up here to illustrate how far higher ed has to go to, you know, escape the Stone Age. Sure, sure. And I'll say it seems as though Purdue is beyond the Stone Age and has a lot of programs in place. So I think a good place is just to kind of set the stage with 
the types of offerings that Purdue has. And I know, you know, you have Purdue online and then you have Purdue Global. And those are two very different initiatives. So wondering if you could just walk us through both of those. Well, thank you for noting the difference because it was confusing. And people even in our own uh, campus and family uh, wondered at first. Purdue Global was your uh, business uh, clients would immediately see it. It was a buy or build decision. And I felt that we were not moving nearly fast enough in online education. We didn't have nearly the uh, capabilities we were going to need to have. And trying to build them here, we were getting in our own way. Meanwhile, people were waking up to the fact that, you know, to reach that $40 trillion number you talked about, Kathy, we're going to need to have a much more um, skilled, educated, often uh, technologically literate population than we have now. And people over the last few years finally came to notice that there were twice as many Americans out there, close to 40 million who had started college and never finished. I'm not talking about people who quit at high school. I'm talking about people who actually spent some money, maybe borrowed some money and did not get a degree. Twice as many of them as all the college students on all the campuses, you know, we talk about all the time, 18 to 24 year old. So Purdue Global, we acquired an existing, then a for-profit, converted it to a public university, a nonprofit. And it basically, right today, it serves that marketplace. It serves the adult learner, especially those who had already accumulated some credit. It tries to help them get to the finish line. When it does, it has an immediate and a very uh, market uh, positive impact on their income and professional status. Now, the second reason we undertook that was, again, that I thought we better acquire a competence that we were stumbling around trying to build ourselves. And we have learned an awful lot. When Purdue Global can conceive, is constantly trying to think what new programs, what new degrees might be relevant to a changing marketplace. I'll give you one, for instance, uh, reformed or modernized policing and criminal justice. Over the last year, there's clearly a need for this. So Purdue Global, first of all, does something higher ed has never historically done, I don't think does a market analysis. Is there really a need? Is there a market? Might somebody show up if we offer this program? And they can do that, stand up the program and launch it in a matter of three or four months, maybe that, if not less. It might be three years on a campus like this one historically. So we've learned a lot about clock speed, what is possible, and about thinking about what we're offering, as we really always should have, in terms of uh, not just what someone here might like to teach, but what someone out there might actually like to buy or a kind of person they might want to hire. So sorry to interrupt. In that case, did you elicit the help of companies like Axon, which does a lot with body cameras and so forth? Or was this just internal research? Do you reach out to the business world to get a sense of how the world's changing? Well, I hope we're always going to do that and do that more and more. Again, at Purdue, at least, this is not particularly new. We have we have a long uh, history of close partnerships with business, although we've done a lot to try to make that become more nimble, easier to work with in the last few years. But certainly in terms of the research that we do, we would call it sponsored research. That is not purchased by the government, but by some business entity. We've had to do a little training here to help our faculty understand The first question is, what is your problem? Not, wouldn't you like to hear what I'm interested in? So, uh, you know, there's a little bit of an attitude adjustment, I guess. But I will also say that I think relevant to our conversation, Purdue as a land-grant school has always had the assignment to uh, specialize in, in the 100 years ago, they said agriculture and the mechanic arts. Well, the mechanic arts have come a long, long way, but that's still, if anything, more important today. So today, the mechanic arts are AI, and they are genomics, and they are precision agriculture, and they are advanced uh, aviation and so forth. And so we uh, made a uh, conscious decision. It was one reason I was excited about coming here was to press for uh, becoming even more STEM-centric than we already were. And we are now basically tied for second in terms of uh, the percentage of our students who are studying one of the scientific or technological disciplines. And in absolute numbers, we're one of the very biggest just because we do this at at real scale. So 
I guess you could say that in a way that's responding to the market. We would also say it's responding to a, a social assignment, we were societal assignment we were given. But it's really um, coupled with the things we've tried to do to encourage innovation and entrepreneurship on the part of our students and faculty and to link them with um, entities outside who might be interested in, in their work. I hope that it's uh, increasing the contribution that we're making. And so then that covers... Purdue Global and the acquisition and serving this underserved population. So then how does Purdue Online emerge? Was that done more in-house and who is that targeting and what are the ultimate goals there? Yeah. So we're trying to apply uh, some uh, greater understanding of the competencies of online that I mentioned. Yes, in a very different, to a very different audience. And we have a rapidly expanding portfolio of offerings some for credit and for degrees, but increasingly people, adult learners who already have degrees, are interested in and in simply enhancing their professional or technological skill. You know, talk to any bench scientist who's been a, away from the research for a while, and they'll tell you that the half-life of in many disciplines, some of the ones that pay special attention to, is pretty short. The people who left here with a first-rate engineering degree 10 or 20 years ago, now find a need to learn something more to advance personally or just simply to make a greater contribution where they are. So we have a fast growing, it's grown 60% in the last three years, I guess, the both the number and the the number of people who are studying in these courses. And though the customer there is increasingly someone in the business world who is, as I say, trying to uh, enhance the value that they already have to somebody in their field. And so then is the ultimate goal with online, I think we were kind of touching on this, the price elasticity of demand for education, you haven't raised prices. And so, you know, in terms of buying power, prices have gone down and you're gaining more and more applicants. You get AI to start being able to help grade. Is the ultimate goal to scale Purdue to as many people as possible? Or is there a different end goal that you're seeking? Well, you're asking a very central question that we've been asking ourselves. We have grown substantially already. For the first time in our history, we're now serving over 100,000 people when you count our three campuses plus the online uh, populations we just talked about. We are seriously discussing whether we couldn't be two times, four times, five times that size. You never want to sacrifice quality but we believe that these things are entirely consistent with each other. So uh, we'll take it step by step, but we don't exclude for a moment the the possibility of growing much, much bigger by one means or another. You know, one reason that we've tried to emphasize speed to degree, there are a lot of good reasons, principally from the student's end, the faster someone achieves a credential and the uh, quality education that presumably goes with it, the sooner they can uh, get started. One more year in the marketplace compounded over a career is a lot of money. So uh, we've worked hard on that. But we can really see a time when, in uh, manufacturing terms, we're trying to increase the throughput uh, through this place. And if we can, without expanding the capital uh, plant and footprint uh, or the staff, if we're more productive about it unduly, we might be able to teach a whole lot more people in the same period of time and uh, at the same cost. And then what has been the reaction of the professors? Obviously, everyone was thrown into the Zoom university, as you mentioned. But what's been the response to the Purdue Online teaching in general? I think by now, it's not only accepted, but been embraced pretty well. As you say, there was not a lot of choice during this last year. We had to really scramble, as did businesses of all kinds, but maybe more than some because it's our product to uh, make available an online version, essentially, of every class. We had to be able to teach students and not only uh, teach them in an equivalent way online, those who chose not to come to campus or couldn't get here. A lot of international students, for instance, couldn't, wanted to come, but couldn't travel. So we had to do that. And even more complicated, we had to have a system that was flexible enough that a student could toggle from in-person to online and back again if we had to quarantine them for 14 days because they tested positive or their roommate tested positive. You see what I mean? So our faculty really rose to that, I must say, in a very big way. When we first 
I bought Purdue Global and there was consternation. And I thought a lot of it was natural. People worried, first of all, didn't understand we were talking about a whole new audience, thought maybe we were going to cheapen the currency of a Purdue degree in some way. These were natural questions. That was all compounded by the fact that we did this very quickly. The time from uh, my first discussion with the people who owned Kaplan before until closing was just a few months. It was very, very quick, even by business standards. And because they were a public company, we couldn't talk about it. So it came as a surprise and that therefore the early reaction was, much of it was very understandable. You know, there was some of that reactionary, uh, any new idea is a bad one that I talked about earlier. But that's, you know, we haven't heard that, any of that in three years here. I guess on that note, are there any, going to that lessons learned topic, you know, things you wish you knew before, you know, I think Purdue's ahead of arguably most universities out there. You know, what should they be wary of in going to online? Or is this a, everyone should go as fast as possible? I think they should. I think the risks of of lassitude or slowness, as they so often do, or um, outweigh the risks of getting it wrong and course correcting as you move forward. And I think that's probably one virtue that many people in various realms have found about the last year. There was no option. So people figured out how to work remotely and figured out how to collaborate with the research partners that you never got to be in the same room with. You know, we were working on it anyway, but we have virtual laboratories now where a student essentially can have the laboratory experience without ever entering the lab. You know, when we get to that $40 trillion economy, boy, I hope you're right about that. That'll be the sort of thing that gets us there. One other thing that Purdue's doing that I think is more common we see in coding boot camps or startups or really innovative companies is the income share agreement. And Purdue has the back boiler program. So can we dive into that and you know how it started, how it's going, and what's involved? Uh, it started, I mean, I was aware of the idea. Milton Friedman thought it up 50 or 60 years ago. But the uh, nation took a very different tack for financing higher ed as it got more and more expensive. And one reason it got more and more expensive, we built this huge infrastructure of student borrowing. But an ISA is, uh, think of it as equity, not debt. So the risk is on the investor, not the person who, in this case, the person who uses the funds. And all it says is that a student, based on the course of study and what history and actuarial science tells us about likely income trajectory, the students, instead of borrowing the money and being on the hook for it at compounding interest, regardless how life goes, agrees to pay a fixed percentage of her or his income for a fixed number of years and therefore renders certain the amount of the exposure. If the career doesn't start very well and the payment is commensurately lower and so forth. So that's what an income share agreement is. We don't recommend it. We have over a thousand people who have now taken those and taken that as a route to help pay for their college education. We don't recommend it in lieu of highly subsidized government loans, but uh, it certainly is uh, preferable in many cases to the uh, very expensive parent loans or so-called plus loans that many students need to put on top of the uh, conventional federal loans, which are limited in size. So uh, there it is. One thing that's very intriguing to me about it And one reason that we've tried to be helpful to other schools who have come to us and wanted to copy it, and that's beginning to spread, is that, first of all, to really help lots and lots of students, we're going to have to attract not just, let's say, uh, philanthropic capital. We have some foundations who have come in and helped us fund this, but it will have to attract real investment capital. The models predict, and we are getting sort of, I'll call it a mezzanine level return, pretty reliable in the you know, five, six, seven percent range. And so if you are looking for that kind of investment, and maybe I'm a, maybe you'd like to do a good deed along the way, here it is, a possibility. And the other advantage of getting to scale, along with helping more young people avoid debt or some of the debt, it will begin to send a real signal as to what the market values, because uh, those majors and those programs that are the most promising will be uh, asked to for a smaller percentage for a shorter period of time of the income that follows. So uh, that would be a helpful market signal for young people coming up in the future. 
That's a great point. That's a great point. And on the government side, right, we've entered this world of ballooning debt. What role do you think the government has in helping fund student education? And then it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on the potential of eliminating student debt. I think there's a reasonable role, obviously, for public universities. And I was very conscious of this. I had no idea I'd wind up in higher ed at the time. But Indiana maintained its funding for higher ed at, I think, the third highest level among the 50 states, uh, especially during the downturn that we experienced. So that's a starting point. I think uh, certainly uh, grants to low-income students, history and time has shown, is probably a better route than the complicated and sometimes, in the end, usurious debt systems that we've created. Now, you say about the elimination, if you're talking about the cancellation of student debt, I don't think a lot of the idea. About 99% of the people who leave here with a degree faithfully have paid back over time, paid back their fellow citizens. And I think it's very unfair to all those people who did if suddenly others are excused from an obligation that they took on. You know, the federal government nationalized all this about 10 years ago blithely predicted a big profit, tens of millions of dollars they were going to make money on this. Well, anybody who paid attention to the federal government knew to suspect that. I'm not sure even we skeptics imagined what is now quite possible, which is hundreds of billions of dollars of dead loss. To a, We're going to lose a lot of money even if they don't forgive debt. If they forgive it, here's the irony. Who's going to get that bill? The same younger generations who, uh, in theory, are supposed to be helped by this. So for various reasons, I'm, I wish a different answer were found. Just to cite one, I, I, we here at Purdue would gladly accept risk. We're doing it now with regard to the so-called back of boiler students. I think it's entirely appropriate to ask a school like this to accept some risk. If you graduate somebody, they go out and it turns out they don't or can't pay back what they borrowed then to an extent, you breached your warranty, in my opinion. You could, it would be entirely fair for us to bear as an institution some part of that loss as opposed to you know, dump it on the taxpayer. I think one of the things we mentioned early on is, you know, if traffic's going at two miles an hour, you're going at 10, it looks like you're in a Ferrari. If you were in a Ferrari, you could snap your fingers and change anything. What does Purdue and higher ed look like to you? Well, my telescope's not quite that powerful, but some of the things we've already talked about, you would use every tool possible to hold down the cost. That would include everything from making this places like this more productive, technology obviously playing a major role. Take some of the uh, useless excess out. We ask students to take a lot of uh, courses now that I don't think are in their long-term interest, but do cost them money and cost time. Become much more flexible both give room and maybe even credit for work experience or uh, maybe other sorts of learning experiences that could be intermingled with the on-campus, more conventional learning. You know, we think both are very, very valuable. You know, we've had a very strong uh, co-op program here for a long time, mainly in our engineering college. And it extends the time to four and a half or even five years. But it's been very, very valuable. We think something like that ought to be available no matter what you're studying. And I do think that it it opens up the possibilities to much more, much closer cooperation, uh, particularly with businesses. You know, businesses, so many are very, very, uh, having a very difficult time finding the kind of talent that they want. You know, we're the most heavily recruited campus in absolute numbers, I think, in the country. I'd have no problem. Business has been using schools like this basically as a filter, as a proxy. I'd like to think Purdue's in a little different category, but in many cases, businesses just say, well, if the, student, if the young person was smart enough to get admitted to that college and then they somehow stuck with it for four years, they're probably a good bet. Well, why not invite them into the process earlier and they could have a you know, direct experience with that student? And probably in most cases, that would lead to a job offer and a career start. But if not, in the meantime, the student learned things they wouldn't have learned, maybe uh, made a little money or defrayed the cost of their education. I think the future is going to be much more mixed in that, in some fashion like that. And I think a lot of our listeners probably don't know nearly as much as the financial workings of an institution as you do. When tuition's rising every year, 
what's the main driver of that? And, you know, Purdue is able to stop it. And how come Purdue can do it and no one else can? Well, I mean, others could. And here and there, you, you're seeing people, you know, the market is finally beginning to speak. So, you know, the little wise guy speech I've given a few times is I'll say to business audiences, now here's the racket you should have gone into. You're selling a product that is seen to be a necessity. You know, you just got to have that college degree. And there's no way for the buyer to assess quality. And so uh, you have total pricing power. You can raise your prices and not lose customers. In fact, it's better than that. You can raise your prices and often attract more customers because people have been using the tuition as a surrogate. If school A costs more than B, I guess it must be better. You know, we have been uh, uh, quietly administering a so-called critical learning test to incoming freshmen. And then we're now getting to the point where they're graduating. We can test them again. You know, I want to be able to show people that students absolutely grew intellectually and in their ability to solve problems and so forth while they were here. But that's never been the case before. And then just to make sure it costs too much, you layer on a, you know, a massive third-party subsidy so that the buyer is insulated or feels insulated, at least till those student debt bills <laughs> come later on, from the real cost. You couldn't not make money under those circumstances. Now, finally, this model is breaking down. Again, my only surprise was it took as long as it did. And by the way, I'm not happy about this. One of our competitive advantages as a country has been a terrific collection of higher education institutions. People have come here from all over the world, which has its own advantages. And so, you know, none of us should want this system to unravel or even struggle. But uh, without the kind of changes you're asking about, you can see that it's going to. And I'm wondering if you're familiar with a company called To You which is a company that's working in while Purdue Online is done in-house, they're partnering with schools to provide the infrastructure and platform for more schools to be able to go online and reduce costs and similar to serving people who have some credits but can't necessarily finish the degree because they're now working. Yeah, I think I have heard of them. And again, this is a incredibly fertile field. I don't doubt that you know, if we don't keep an eye on uh, what others are doing and don't try a few new, constantly try new things ourselves, we'll be left behind, as I was afraid we were just four or five years ago. All right. Well, we're wrapping up on time here. and We can't let you go without talking about the space race. Is that where you were going, Sam? You go for it, and then I'll follow up. Okay. The space race. I mean, Purdue has been at the vanguard of space, but this frontier is now exploding, according to our analysis. And actually, Sam is our primary analyst on the space race and, you know, all of the costs that are coming down and the technologies that are evolving to make even flying to Mars, perhaps within, I don't know whose lifetime here, but a reality, <laughs> certainly Sam's. So I uh, just wondered if, because you do have this space program and it's been so successful over the years, if this has also informed your decision-making about what you need to do to catapult Purdue, but also the educational system into the right orbit. Well, thanks for noticing. Yeah, nobody has a tradition quite like ours, 25 astronauts and counting, the most of any school from Apollo, Neil Armstrong himself, and all the way forward. As of at least a year or two ago, one third of all U.S. manned space flights had at least one Boilermaker on board. That's, that's how deeply involved we have been. And if you were to visit, uh, when you visit, you know, the uh, big companies that have emerged here, the Blue Origins and SpaceX and so forth, I mean, you'll trip over a Purdue grad literally every 50 feet. I mean, it's something our young people really do aspire to, uh, particularly the private uh, companies. And I think that's great. You ask how it's informed us. You know, it's just uh, in a very general way, it's really shaped us. We had our 150th anniversary two years ago. Well, 2019, so a year and a half. Yeah, but people were casting about this thing needs a theme, you know, and so forth. Well, it was so obvious the minute somebody said it, giant leaps. And we built the whole year around that. We went back and looked for people here who had uh, made two giant leaps in one of two ways, if not both. One, intellectual leaps. You know, we have Nobel Prize winners and people who have and are today inventing and devising fabulous new technologies that just, you know, boggle a, a non-scientist like me. And on the other hand, as a land-grant school, we were put here 
to help people from modest backgrounds not only go to college, which when we started, only the elite did, and then go on to do great things. You know, when I meet fabulous uh, Purdue grads who we've had more CEOs than almost any other school, go look anytime at the Fortune 100, 300, 500, you'll find a number of, of Purdue grads leading them. These people almost never came from uh, privileged backgrounds. You know, this is the place where the young person from the small town or the farm or the inner city came, public university, more affordable. And, and I guess that's why we're still so committed to that whole idea. And so this campus was festooned for a year. We had program after program about giant leaps, playing off Neil Armstrong's famous first words. So you ask you know, how it's shaped us in all these ways from the most specific, namely our commitment to aeronautical and astrophysical research to entrepreneurship and constantly trying to encourage that next advance, just to the general ethos of the place. And I uh, hope we never lose it. Shooting for the stars. It's us. Always, always. So now we're really out of time. So I'll just ask a quick personal question that we like to ask people is, What's a book that you would recommend to the audience that you found particularly insightful? Homo Deus by this guy, Harari. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, I was just asked a question very like this. And I said, okay, look, let me give you two. Stephen Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, and then the Harari book. And I said, the reason, read the Pinker book so you'll stop whining. Read the Harari book so you'll start worrying. <laughs> And, you know, a, a little of both, I guess, are, are useful these days. But, you know, there's a lot of useful stuff out there to read. But just off the top of my head, those come to mind. Great. Thank you so much for joining us today. And maybe we'll put another one on the books and we'll just dive into space. Kathy, this is on you now. So <laughs> It's on us. Yeah. We're, a <laughs> We're a team. Okay. So thank you so much, Governor Daniels. It has been such a pleasure and a privilege. Enjoyed it. Do it again sometime. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.